Okay, part two of realism. We have covered Corbet and Millet and Corot. Now we're going to cover Manet, and the bulk of this is going to be about him. So Manet is considered the first modernist painter. He is sometimes seen as the grandfather of Impressionism. All right, so this painting, Déjeuner sur l'herbe, or Luncheon on the Grass, is from 1863, and there's a lot going on in here, so we're going to take our time with this painting. First of all, I imagine that you have noticed that there is this naked lady, basically, with these two men on a picnic. And I say naked lady knowing what that means, because generally when we look at paintings, it has this sort of classical nude vibe to it in which the woman's painted perfectly. I mean, you have Rubenesque women that do have their cellulite and veins showing, etc. But even those women were supposed to have sort of a goddess-like quality. But Manet is giving us a woman without her clothes on, having a picnic with two men with their clothes on. So right from the top, this nudity was scandalous. And it was thanks to Courbet who rejected the Academy and all that the Academy gave us, Manet was able to get away with this. Now Manet did want to be considered sort of a part of the French Academy. He just was trying to create a new vocabulary. But this nude was not mythological. There was no historical narrative. This is just a contemporary woman in contemporary life. And Manet believed that you have to be of your time and you have to paint what you see. One of the reasons that Manet is seen as the grandfather Impressionism is because the brush strokes on this are very visible. And this was very much unlike academic painting at the time, where the hand of the artist was completely removed. We're, we're going to look at a few different sort of comparisons with this painting and other things, and we'll compare, compare this to a painting that was made in the same year that would have been accepted by the Academy. And you'll see the difference in the two. A few other things that Manet does is he distorts space and depth. That woman in the background, that bather, she's kind of, there's a wonky perspective going on there. And it doesn't really work unless she's a giant, which she is not. So this is the beginning of the end of Renaissance perspective and depth. This painting is being treated as a surface rather than a window for the past 400 years paintings were seen as windows into another reality. And Manet is starting to mess with that idea. And you'll see this further explored with Cubism. And um, Cezanne will look at paintings by him and the idea of perspective. But Manet is the first one to mess with perspective. And it's off-putting, but in a way that keeps us looking at it, trying to figure it out. It's, it's kind of one of those puzzles that we're like, I don't understand what's going on with this woman in the background. And one of the reasons you don't understand is because there's no clear narrative. Uh, Manet is proclaiming that he is the one who decides what his art will look like. He's not handing the reins over to the Academy and saying, okay, I've painted this mythological figure, and these are the symbols that mean this or that. He's not ascribing to all that stuff. He's saying, this is what it is. And I am the one who determines how my paintings are going to look, not some room full of men who make regulations and rules. People knew who these three figures were. The woman is Victorine Morin, and she was a street performer who eventually became a painter in her own right. And we will see her again in many Manet paintings. Her confident pose seems to confront the viewer. And we'll talk about this more and how she's doing this, but I mean, you, you have to imagine yourself going to all these galleries as a man, and then there are all these women that are erotically posed, but also aloof. But this woman is staring right at you. And he's doing that on purpose. This is like Courbet's Stonebreakers, in which this is reality. We're giving it to you. There's no allegories in here or metaphors. This is a woman without her clothes on having a picnic in a forest with a couple of men. It was very sensational. We're starting to get to the point in art history where if you're not angry at a painting, then it's not going to be important anymore. Somebody has to be angry about a painting. And what happened in 1863 was there were so many paintings that were submitted to the 
academic salon show that were refused that Napoleon III opened a second show, and he called it the Salon des Refusés, or the Show of the Refused. And there were over 3,000 rejected works, and Manet's painting was in that. And he was mad. He wanted to be in the actual salon, the regular salon of the academic paintings. But instead, he was put into this show. However, his painting was the most outrageous painting of the show. And there's a couple of reasons why. It wasn't just that there was this nude woman and these men, and that they knew most people knew who this woman was and these, these men, but it was his embrace of art history in which people would have known these things and what he was doing with this vast knowledge of art history. This is fascinating. So on the bottom left, there is this painting by Titian, who was a Renaissance painter. It's called The Pastoral Concert. And in it, you have two men that are sitting together in some kind of field. And then there is this nude woman playing like a little concert for them. To the right is a lost painting by Raphael. And you can see that the poses are almost exactly identical. And that painting is called The Judgment of Paris. Now, Paris being the man who stole Helen away from Sparta and caused the Trojan War. But Paris in this painting. Dejeuner sur l'herbe is the city of Paris, those art goers, those patrons of art, those people who walk up to a painting of a woman and don't think about the fact that it's really a woman. Manet is telling the Parisian art world to take a look at itself and how it treats women, or at least how it treats paintings of women. As if to say, let's not pretend that you aren't getting some kind of pleasure out of these naked women. Manet doubles down on this idea with his next painting, Olympia, from 1863. And Olympia is a common name for a prostitute. And it's also uh, an allusion to a fictional character in a play by Alexandre Dumas. And so that's Victorine Morant again. She's not really a prostitute but she's being portrayed as one. But everybody knows her, and everyone knows her as this performer, uh, as an aspiring painter. But in this painting, she is a prostitute, and there are a bunch of signs to show us that. There is the orchid in her hair, her bracelet, her pearl earrings, and the oriental shawl on which she lies, the black ribbon around her neck, her cast-off slipper, flowers from one of her patrons, given to her by her black servant. And even the inclusion of the black servant goes back to this judgment of Paris idea. He's commenting on the French colonialist mindset and then also providing the stark contrast with the whiteness of Olympia. The black woman served as a powerful emblem of primitive sexuality, one of many fictions that justified colonial views or colonialism of non-Western societies. In a number of paintings thus far in this semester, we've seen dogs that represent fidelity and truthfulness. And in this one, we have a cat. And le chat, which is French for cat, is slang for female genitalia. Now, what's really startling about this is how similar it is to Las Meninas by Velazquez. Not in its subject matter, because of course not. But our placement in front of this painting is meaningful because it's as if we are the next customer and we have startled the cat and we have caught Olympia's attention, although she's not that surprised to see us. Here's another comparison to Titian, the Renaissance painter, and his Venus of Urbino, Venus, the goddess of love, is curvaceous and alluring. And Manet's Olympia is none of those things. She is angular and flattened, and she's staring at us. And her, the like, she's not accommodating our looking at her. She is staring back at us. And so what Manet is saying is that viewers can no longer claim to be art lovers gazing upon an ideal beauty. Now they're just kind of perverts staring at a naked woman. So. Here's a 
uh, comparison between Manet's Olympia that was painted in 1863 and Cabanel's Birth of Venus that was also painted in 1863. One made it into the Salon and the other made it into the Salon des Refusés. I'll let you guess which one. What I want you to do is compare these two and comment on how the painter feels about the subject matter and who the painter might be painting this for. Like, who is Manet hoping to sell this painting to, and who is Cabanel hoping to sell this painting to? And just their formal differences. Like, what is different about them just by looking at them and discussing the different characteristics? We're going to come back to Manet when we look at Impressionism, but we're going to switch over to Whistler now, because he doesn't really fit in any kind of... Sometimes he gets lumped in with the Impressionists, sometimes with the Realists. I put him with the realist, so mostly because he was also in the Salon de Refusé in 1863. This painting was rejected, and it's called Symphony in White Number no. 1, and he believed that the arrangement of a room or a painting could be aesthetically pleasing itself without reference to the outside world. So what he was seeking to do was satisfy this kind of elitist taste for pure beauty. His art was purely aesthetic. It was art for art's sake. This is when that idea comes up. Just, this isn't about anything else. This is just an artful representation. It's a departure from observed reality. She's this prop on a stage. He would get upset when critics attempted to, like, add meaning to it. They compared this painting to the first mystery novel in 1859 called Woman in White, and Critics were, like, angry that they didn't see any references from the book. And he said, I'd never read that book. They tried to claim that it was about lost innocence. And he was like, no, this painting simply represents a girl dressed in white standing in front of a white curtain. You might also have noticed that this is called Symphony in White Number no. 1, which is really weird for a painting because that usually refers to a musical composition. And he named it that because he wanted you to pay attention to sort of the tonal values and just the overall composition of the painting. So by applying a musical term with it, he's de-emphasizing, you know, the idea that this has to be about something. It is what it is. And no one ever listens to a symphony and goes, I wonder if that's about this or that. Sometimes they are, but for the most part, you just accept music as this thing to enjoy without trying to ascribe other things to it. Okay, we're going to end this discussion on realism with one last Whistler painting. And again, it's realism because it's not trying to be anything else than it is. That woman in white is a woman in white. Those stonebreakers are stonebreakers. They're not allusions to anything. That Olympia is a prostitute. She's not the Venus this is all about sort of representing exactly what it's supposed to be representing. So this last one is Nocturne in Black and Gold, or The Falling Rocket, and it depicts a fireworks show with several observers in the foreground. And it was criticized as unfinished or as someone flinging a pot of paint into the audience's face. The person that actually said this was sued by Whistler. Whistler said, I don't appreciate you criticizing my work in this way. So he took him to court and sued the critic, his name was John Ruskin, for libel. And Whistler won the court battle, but he was only awarded a farthing in damages. And because this court trial was so highly publicized, Whistler was able to defend these paintings as artistic arrangements that transcended the ideals of harmony and beauty. Okay, that's it for today. The art movements are going to start coming fast and furious. The new ideas reject those older ideas. Next up, Impressionism. See you then.